Greetings everybody, my name is Tommy the Game Master and welcome to my channel again. Well, uh, today I decided to do a quick audio rant about a few things I've seen in the last few days on the news and just decided to give people my opinions on them. Um, the first two have to deal with GameStop and uh, one of them's really good and the other one's a little bit annoying but it wouldn't exactly keep me from telling people not to do business with them. They're entitled to their own opinions and my thoughts. Anyways, the good news is, is GameStop is offering kind of this rental program. I think it's Power Play or something like that. You go into their store, you pay $60 for six months, so I think that would make it about $10 a month, and you can basically check out any used game they have and then return it to them once you're done playing it and get another one or you can even purchase it at a discount this is kind of similar to what microsoft is doing with uh, digital content microsoft xbox has a similar program except since it's digital it's probably going to be a lot longer than when gamestop starts to get used games from people who still buy physical media i personally think this is a great idea i know a lot of people who would be very interested in this. I'm not because I kind of more shop by um, Steam discounts than I would do by this. But I think this is a really great idea. I think it will keep them relevant for a lot longer than they would have without it. And I can see gamers getting excited. I think it's a good deal. And yes, in the future, I if it's still around when I'm done with some of my Steam backlog, I might go spend $60 for this program and check it out. I think it was a great idea on GameStop's part and worth talking about. The second thing that I did see Rich of Review Tech USA talk about, and to me this was a non-issue, and that is GameStop is defending loot boxes. This doesn't surprise me, people. Now, if you've seen some of my past videos on the ideas of loot boxes, I myself am not going to touch a AAA game that shoves loot boxes into their system. Some games do need them, and some games are built around them, and I can understand that. If you're building a game like Overwatch, which is supposed to be a game that's supposed to last you years with online play, why they might do loot boxes. I disagree with the whole concept, but I'm not necessarily saying, "Er, that's a bad thing for that game. However, it seems like the AAA publishers, and they don't need the money. A lot of people are like, well, games are more expensive to make. Yes, they are in the development cycle, but guess what? Digital distribution has basically cut down the price of what it takes to put it on the media. Back in the good old days of the NES, it wasn't the development costs that would sink a publisher or a developer. It was oftentimes the cost of the media. You had cartridges. That's Then the PlayStation came around and actually found a way to make a system that uses CD properly. I know they weren't the first, but they were the first ones to be really successful at using um, the disc-based system. And that cut down the price of the media a whole, whole lot. That's why PlayStation 1 games were so cheap for their days. And then, you know, as the development costs kind of risen and with inflation, you did see games go back up to $60 again. However, digital distribution basically cuts the cost of what it takes to ship a game to virtually zero. So anytime they say the developers need the money or the publishers need that money, um, they're lying. The publishers are doing just fine. Why they like the idea of microtransactions and loot boxes is because it keeps the uh, money always flowing. Which again, makes them a whole lot less riskier to invest in. So. Yeah, they're basically, I think, gambling the game industry on investors, on fair-weather friends, and that always is going to end in a disaster. And you know you're going to hear about it eventually. Someone who's either kid or they themselves were irresponsible enough to blow their entire paycheck on a bunch of loot boxes and can't afford food or the rent going to either sue or going to talk to a politician and then we're going to have regulations on this, and then everything's going to become a mess. So I despise loot boxes. Now on to GameStop and what I saw there. 
they were a bit childish in their response when people started talking about it, I will say that. But they weren't entirely unprofessional. They didn't cuss out. They just had this air of annoyance and saying, you know, our stance isn't going to change on this. And I will tell you why GameStop is not going to confront this. Don't expect them to. Is they need gains from the AAA publishers to survive. What people like me who are getting kind of fed up with it are doing is we're switching to the indie titles that are available on Steam or in available on the Xbox One marketplace on the PSN network that don't have a physical counterpart and are usually only 10 to $30. They can do that because they don't have that media cost to make a disc to put it in a plastic and then to sell it to the retailer. They can cut that um, whole cost off so they can sell you a cheaper game. Um, usually indie games don't hit GameStop unless they're extremely successful, that there's actually a demand for a physical copy for collectors. So indie games do no good for GameStop. They have to have these AAA publishers. They need that part of the industry to survive. So GameStop is going to be defending this. I think it's stupid. They need to speak out about it because I see these loot boxes. I see these microtransactions. When that bubble bursts, when people get fed up with it, or when the politicians start to find some new way to regulate them, it's going to be a freaking mess. I just see that coming. This does not keep me from um, shopping at GameStop. They're entitled to their opinion, and although I disagree with it, um, I won't you know, avoid that place when I do my holiday shopping. This isn't the circle of life, which was... Um, dealing with their actions. They were telling people to lie to their customers, which I thought was extremely stupid in the age of digital distribution to tell your employees to lie to people who actually want to um, get out of their house to purchase their media from you in a store environment instead of from the comfort of their home to say you're okay with lying to them or even encouraging. That was stupid, but GameStop got rid of it. So... Overall, my opinion of GameStop um, as of this week is still pretty high, even after that Facebook scruffle. Anyways, this leads me to another area I want to talk about in my rant. And Rich brought it up in his video about whether there'll be a crash in the game industry or not. And usually when I hear, oh, there's going to be another crash, it usually comes from people who are younger. They were born in the 90s. They heard in the 80s one game crashed the industry, so therefore the game industry must be always extremely fragile. Okay kids, let me say this again. E.T. was not that bad a game. I have played a lot worse on my channel and reviewed a lot worse games than freaking E.T. What killed the game industry and what caused E.T. to crash the game industry was a series of bad choices it was almost a death by a thousand paper cuts would be a better way to describe the death of Atari they did not make one extremely bad game and went away they made hundreds and worse because of some upper management buffoonery lost the ability to, to really control what went on their platformers which led a whole bunch of crappy third party games Think about the uh, crap you get on Steam, but worse, and you kind of see my point here. You had Kool-Aid making video games by themselves. You had video games promoting Alpo by themselves. You even had pornography video games sold with the Atari name and on the Atari license. Um, this is Atari porn. Angry Video Game Nerd did a uh, video about that. Um, it's nothing, it's kind of silly, actually, but, you know, those were the types of games that you were getting out there. There were no content controls. Back in the 80s, you did not have YouTube. You did not have your Jim Sterlings. You did not have your Sid Alpha. You did not have other people on the Steam storefront trying to screen this garbage from hitting the marketplace. Nowadays, we do, so that's not what's going to kill the industry if a crash comes. What's going to kill the industry, or I should say majorly change it, a renaissance is what Rich said, is just the continuing technology 
in the expansion of it is really going to change. And right now, when it comes to these AAA developers, they are really hyper-focused on only one set of the marketplace. Now granted, it's a vocal set, it's a set that does play a lot of video games, and it's a very loyal set for the most part. That's why pissing them off is a bad idea. But it is still just a small part of a very, very large and growing marketplace. And that's the people who play online open world games, your Overwatchers, your Call of Duties, and other people who really buy a lot of games and want to spend a lot of money on the enjoyment of their games. But that's just a small part of the marketplace. There are people like me who are the... I'm more of what I would call a either a JRPG player, an RPG player, or more likely a budget gamer. I like to buy a whole bunch of games I can find dirt cheap. That's what I usually review on my channel, what I purchased dirt cheap or what I purchased a long time ago as a kid with a nostalgic attachment. And you're kind of completely forgetting people like this, the people who enjoy the single-player games, the people who kind of don't want to spend a whole bunch of money on one game and eventually it wants the uh, marketplace of these um, market that you're looking for gets dried up because it's oversaturated because that's what's going to happen people who play Call of Duty enjoy Call of Duty people who play Overwatch enjoy Overwatch they oftentimes don't go out and spend three or four games at once while doing this and eventually the bubble's going to pop and you're going to be in trouble because you basically alienated everybody else. That's what I see is happening. What's going to happen after that is I think we're going to see a bunch of indies kind of pop up. Um, the only thing that I think is keeping indie developers from really prospering and getting huge. The only setback is some of these digital distribution stores, especially Steam, need to have more quality control over who can purchase them. Um, I'm about to do a video on a bunch of games I purchased for a dollar or less thanks to Steam coupons. Um, I won't say like they're the worst games ever made or that there was no passion in some of these games I'm about to review. But I can say that um, the lack of quality control and the fact that you can get hundreds of games like these onto the market really makes it so game developers who spent actual money, a lot of money to develop a quality game have a hard time getting noticed to people who uh, spent three days to code a game that they used other people's assets for and pushed it out with absolutely no quality control. But Steam is starting to crack down on that, um, and we are seeing improvements on that and targeting assets flippers. Once Steam gets its act together and um, we actually have decent quality control, and personally I think Steam can probably stop some of the chicanery with their um, asset flipper problem just by saying, you can only publish if you're an indie developer, and yes, I know this is unfair, quote-unquote, but if you're a small-time indie developer with absolutely no reputation or good games under your belts that sold, that made us money and didn't cause us any problems, you're only entitled to put three or four games a year onto our service. It will make these people um, stop the people who are just out to make a quick buck have no passion for whatever they're doing, no quality control right in, the, right in their steps. And the people who um, want to put out a good game but might be novices, it might give them time to really think about the type of game they're making rather than just shove schlock out onto the Steam store. But I do see some changes in that, and when that happens, I do see, like I said, a transformation of the industry. The year of the loot boxes, the uh, microtransactions being crammed down our throat, they're not going to last forever, folks. They're not going to go away anytime soon. These games are still selling, but it's going to pop eventually. Um, the game crash of 83 did happen because it was all of a sudden. You really have to look at what was going on in the marketplace a little bit in deeper to realize, no, it wasn't one game. It was a series of bad decisions that crashed Atari. Same thing here. 
these people are going to make some decent money on the loot boxes. These open world games, these games of service, are going to be doing good for a time. It's probably going to last three or four years. And then it's probably going to end. Whether it will be a soft end and as people look for other things that these AAA publishers have decided to completely stop supporting, or um, rather it will be a big crash, I don't know, but interesting times are coming. Anyways, this is Tommy the Game Master thanking you for listening to this rant. I'll see you guys later.